They had departed from New York two hours earlier on a Friday afternoon, and they still had one more hour of driving before reaching home. Just recently, they had bid farewell to their only child, Lisa, as they dropped her off at her college campus to commence her studies. Nancy cast a glance at her husband, Bill, who was behind the wheel of their Ford Transit. They had opted for this vehicle to transport Lisa's belongings, as her BMW 230i convertible was not suitable for that purpose. Sheesh, time really flies, Nancy thought. It felt like just yesterday when it was her high school graduation day and she discovered she was pregnant. Bill, meanwhile, was still in college, pursuing his engineering studies. Both sets of parents were supportive, fully aware of their children's love for each other. After the baby was born, she stayed with her parents, and they tied the knot once Bill completed his studies. For over 10 years, she has been a stay-at-home mom, while Bill's career progressed from a junior engineer to owning his own HVAC business. His hard work paid off, securing significant contracts with construction companies. Throughout it all, Bill's dedication to both work and family remained unwavering. The house won't be the same without her, Bill said with a tinge of sadness. She's always been closer to you than me, your little princess, she replied. Yeah, she's our princess and deserves the best, Bill remarked. Have you noticed how she's been acting lately? She asked. She's been treating me terribly whenever you're around. She sticks to you like glue, sometimes even making fun of me. And when you're not here, she locks herself in her room, avoiding me completely. Oh, Nancy, she's still just a kid. Senior year of high school is tough, you know. She was under so much pressure trying to get into Columbia University. Try to cut her some slack, Bill empathized. I get that, Bill. But have you seen the way she looks at me when we're in the same room? Remember that incident two months ago when she came at me with a knife while I was sitting on the couch? I thought she was going to hurt me. I saw pure hatred in her eyes, Nancy recounted. You're imagining things, Nancy, Bill snapped. Nancy fell silent, not wanting to escalate the argument further. She didn't want Bill to get angry, not now. Taking out her phone, she sent a text message. We'll be there in 30 minutes. A minute later, her phone beeped. Is that from Lisa? Bill inquired. No, it's Betty. How's she doing with Paul? Last time at our BBQ, she was complaining about him working late nights, putting in too many hours, and prioritizing others over her. She should have known being married to a sheriff isn't easy. She should have thought twice before tying the knot, Nancy shared. Once again, Nancy stayed silent, hoping Bill would keep his cool until they got home. She leaned against the window, praying they had already arrived. As Bill pulled into his driveway, he spotted a sheriff's car parked in front of the garage. He parked behind it, and Paul, along with his assistant, stepped out to greet him. What's going on, Bill? Paul asked, puzzled. At the same time, Nancy hurried to stand behind the assistant, which didn't escape Bill's notice. This is the part of my job, Paul began to explain. I hate the most, the sheriff said handing Bill a plain envelope. William Thompson, you've been served. Paul's words struck Bill, causing his hand to tremble as he accepted the envelope. He turned to Nancy, but she couldn't bring herself to meet his gaze. Why, Nancy? What did I do? Bill asked, his voice filled with a mix of confusion and despair. It's best if you go, Bill, Paul interjected. Get yourself a lawyer and work on your divorce. There's also a restraining order. You can't be near Nancy or come within 500 feet of her. Paul, last Sunday, you and Betty were at our barbecue for Lisa's farewell. Bill's voice began to rise. You both knew what was going on. You came, ate, wished Lisa well, and left with smiles. That's what I call hypocrisy. Bill, please try to understand. Paul calmly responded. What do you want me to understand, Paul? That you're a jerk. Bill shouted. His anger turned towards Nancy. And you, Nancy, you betrayed me. He glared at her with a mixture of hurt and fury. If you didn't love me anymore, you should have just told me. I would have agreed to a peaceful divorce. The restraining order is already in place. It's best for you to leave now, Paul said, attempting to maintain his composure. Bill stomped over to his van, angrily tossing the envelope onto the passenger seat. He slammed the door shut and then marched back to confront Paul. I need my stuff. I hope you're not going to be a jerk and stop me from going into my house to get my things, he demanded. Bill took out his house key and headed towards the front door. 
Your key won't work, Paul stated, pulling out another set of keys from his pocket and handing them to his assistant. It seems you've thought of everything. Or was it Betty's idea? Bill accused. She probably arranged for a locksmith while we were gone, am I right? Paul didn't respond, merely nodding at his assistant, who led Bill into the house and stood by as he packed two suitcases. Don't worry, Paul reassured Nancy. I'll have my guys keep an eye on the place. It's not safe for you to be here alone for a while. Bill's really upset, and he might do something rash out of anger. I'll stay put. I'll call a friend to come stay with me for the weekend, Nancy said, determined. Yeah, a friend, Paul muttered under his breath. Bill brought out the suitcases and placed them in the back of the van. The assistant handed Nancy the keys. Bill then opened the envelope and started reading the divorce papers. Bill, you got your stuff. It's time to go, Paul instructed. Hold on. This woman wants half of my business, half of our savings, the house, her car, and monthly alimony. She's trying to take me to the cleaners. Bill exclaimed, his anger boiling over. I'll have to arrest you, Paul warned, reaching for handcuffs. No need, Paul. I'll sign the papers now and disappear, Bill said, grabbing a pen and signing where indicated. Can you witness this and give me my copy, Nancy? Paul and his assistant were stunned. They never expected Bill to agree to the terms. Nancy smiled, feeling fortunate that she got everything she wanted and was finally free of her husband and daughter. Paul signed as a witness and handed Bill his copy. Bill got into his van, seething with anger. Who is he? How long have you been with him? Bill demanded. Go inside and lock the door, Paul instructed Nancy before approaching Bill's van. His assistant escorted Nancy inside. Don't do anything foolish. Think about Lisa, Paul advised. I made a mistake marrying this witch. Bill yelled as he started the engine. She chose divorce because she knew I wouldn't accept an open marriage like you. What open marriage? Paul asked, shocked. Don't act innocent, Paul. It's common knowledge, Bill retorted. What are you saying? Paul's voice rose. Come on, Paul. We all know when you're working nights, your brother Tom is keeping your bed warm. Are you trying to turn me against my brother, you jerk? Oh man, she's cheating on you, Bill said, breaking the news. Sorry to break it to you, but look, Paul, as a sheriff, you can tell when someone's lying. Go home and ask Betty, then you'll see. Bill backed up and left the property as instructed. Alone, Nancy poured herself a glass of wine and stood before Pagnol's masterpiece, the train station, worth over a hundred grand. He left it here. His loss, she thought with a wicked smile. She picked up her phone and dialed a number from her speed dial. Come on, Jason, answer your damn phone. Nancy let out a frustrated shout before ending the call abruptly. She had expected him to come directly to her place after work. Muttering to herself, she took a seat and sipped her wine, reminiscing about their first encounter. It had been a year since they ran into each other at the department store where he worked in the shoe section. He was young and in good shape, and she was immediately captivated. They exchanged numbers, and the following day she invited him over during his lunch break. He came and left her feeling exhilarated, as if she had experienced a thrilling night. She couldn't deny the excitement and energy he brought compared to Bill, who was always exhausted from work, spent his evenings helping Lisa with homework, and then collapsed into bed, leaving Nancy unsatisfied. Finishing her wine and pouring another glass, Nancy attempted to call Jason again but received the same unavailable message. Frustrated, she tossed her phone onto the couch and turned on the TV, but her mind couldn't concentrate. Opting for a shower, memories of Jason fulfilling her forbidden desires flooded her thoughts. He had made it clear that her pleasures belonged to him alone. With a spare key to his apartment, she would occasionally clean while he was at work, shower him with gifts, and even let him drive her BMW. Oh God, I need him right now. I'm so turned on. I need him to satisfy me, Nancy muttered to herself. She tried to recall the last time she had been intimate with Bill, but couldn't remember if it was three months six months, or even longer ago. However, it didn't matter anymore, because she had her young lover, a real man who could fulfill her desires. They could be together without fear, and he would move in with her that evening. After her shower, Nancy returned to the living room, grabbed her cell phone, and cursed once again. Where are you, Jason? Why won't you answer the damn phone? 
Frustrated, she went to the kitchen and prepared a light dinner. Damn, I can't leave the house, or I would have driven to his place, she thought. Suddenly, something on the TV caught her attention, and she hurried back to the living room, turning up the volume. She watched in horror as Paul, in handcuffs, was escorted to a police car. Sheriff Paul Anderson shot his wife in the head and then went to his brother's workplace, where he shot him five times. Both the wife and the brother have passed, the news anchor reported. Nancy switched off the TV and sat down, shocked. Oh, Betty, I cautioned you to be cautious, she exclaimed that evening. She couldn't sleep at all. It was the first time she truly felt alone. Her husband had left, her lover was unreachable, her best friend was dead, her daughter was distant, and her parents had passed away. The only person left was her sister, who lived 300 miles away with her husband, Tom. Saturday came and went with no word from Jason. She felt both anxious and frustrated. He could at least leave a message to inform me of what's going on, Nancy repeated in her mind. On Sunday morning, she made the decision to drive to Jason's apartment. As soon as she stepped inside, she sensed that something was amiss. The walls were bare, electronics were missing, and his closet and bathroom were empty. She collapsed onto the bed. He's gone. He left without a word, Nancy cried. How could he do this? He was the one who suggested divorcing Bill and moving in with me. We were going to get married after the divorce was finalized. She left the apartment and drove to the department store, hoping to find Jason at work. Instead, she encountered one of his key workers who informed her that Jason had requested to leave work on Friday morning to retrieve his wallet, but never returned. Later that day, he sent a resignation email to their boss. Nancy walked to her car, tears streaming down her face. Why did he do this to me? She sobbed. On her way home, she stopped at a gas station and was taken aback to discover that both her credit and debit cards were declined. Frustrated, she paid with the last of her cash. At home, she drowned her sorrows in alcohol. Monday morning, she went to the bank and spoke with the manager. She was shocked to learn that there was less than $5 left in her joint account. Mrs. Thompson, your husband visited the bank last Friday and closed your joint credit card, the manager explained. He also informed us of your divorce and that he wouldn't be responsible for the mortgage on the house or your car anymore. That's a mistake. My car was fully paid off, and the house mortgage should have been settled, Nancy said, bewildered. We have paperwork showing a car loan and a second mortgage on the house for your daughter's university fees, the manager replied. But why is there no money in my account? Nancy asked. Your account was debited to pay the monthly mortgage and there haven't been any deposits for the last three months. Whatever money was there has been depleted. What about my husband's business? There should be monthly transfers from the company's account, Nancy inquired. Unfortunately, Mrs. Thompson, I am unable to provide Mr. Thompson's account details or discuss business matters with you. However, if you fail to make the upcoming mortgage payment, there is a risk of your house and car being repossessed. But I don't have a job, Nancy expressed. I suggest you discuss this with your lawyer. Later, she checked the safe deposit box she shared with her husband. Only her jewelry remained. She collected it all and placed it in her handbag. Outside the bank, she attempted to call Bill on his cell phone, but it was out of service. Perplexed, she dialed his work number, but it continued to ring without any response. Frustrated, she dialed Lisa's number. What do you want, witch? Lisa snapped angrily. Is that how you talk to your mother? Nancy asked, shocked. How else should I talk to you? Lisa retorted. You're the worst. You dumped dad like he meant nothing. I'm done with you. Don't call me again. I'm changing my number. Then the line went dead. Nancy sat in her car, stunned, gripping the steering wheel. Her thoughts raced as she tried to comprehend why Jason left without a word, questioning where her plan went wrong. She called her lawyer and secured a same-day appointment for the late afternoon. After your call this morning, Mrs. Thompson, we looked into your husband's company, her lawyer informed her. He filed for bankruptcy last Thursday, before being served by you. The company is likely to be dissolved. But you said I could receive millions last time, Nancy exclaimed. Please, Mrs. Thompson, try to stay calm, her lawyer urged. Just two weeks ago, there were no signs of financial trouble. Everything seemed to be in your favor. Now the company's bank account is frozen. 
And what about the car and the house mortgage? Last week, he used your house as collateral for a loan, again before being served. As for the car, when you sign the ownership document, you also sign for a loan in your name. This can't be true, Nancy cried. Mrs. Thompson, I have a personal question, her lawyer said. Do you think your husband knew about being served? No, Nancy replied, looking thoughtful. He never saw it coming. She took a deep breath. So, if I understand correctly, I won't receive a penny from my husband's company. I don't have any money in my bank account, and I'm afraid my car and house will be repossessed. Is there any way to make him pay the mortgage, at least? His company was his only source of income, but now that it's gone, he's broke. Once he finds a job, we can make him pay you alimony. We had some investment certificates, but I couldn't find them in our safe deposit box. We'll investigate when he cashed those certificates and thoroughly examine his company. We also need to locate your husband. His legal advisor is handling everything. Please proceed. One thing, Mrs. Thompson, the lawyer interjected. These additional services will come with added costs. How will you cover the expenses? Nancy hadn't considered the financial aspect, but then she smiled. I have a valuable painting. Great. Get the money and write us a check so we can get started. No problem. I'll call you soon. One more thing, Mrs. Thompson. In the worst case scenario, be prepared to leave your house. You should start looking for a new place to live. At home, she sat in front of Pagnol's masterpiece. I wanted to keep you, but because of my husband, we have to part ways, she said to the painting. Then she called her sister. Hey, sis, I need a favor. You know I'll do anything for you. Nancy and Bill are divorcing. What is this, some kind of joke? No, sis. It's complicated. I'll need a place to stay temporarily. Can I stay in your guest room? I'll explain everything when we meet. What about Lisa? How is she taking it? She's definitely daddy's girl. I'm the one who gets the blame. Is there any chance you two can figure things out? Maybe see a counselor? I doubt it. I'm really sorry. There's no issue on my end. I don't think Tom would mind, and our daughter would be thrilled to have you stay with us for a while. Thanks, sis. I'll keep you posted on when I'll be there. Nancy ended the call. On Tuesday, she visited a jeweler to appraise her jewelry. To her surprise, she was informed that all her pieces were gold-plated copper and of low quality. She cursed Bill for giving her fake gifts. Then she hurried to an art gallery, where she met with an appraiser. I'm curious about the value of my Pagnol painting, the train station Nancy inquired. The appraiser carefully examined every detail of the painting. The train station is considered Pagnol's masterpiece. It encapsulates a range of emotions, from arrivals and departures to joy and sorrow. He placed the painting on an easel and illuminated it with a spotlight. Then he took a magnifying glass and began inspecting it closely. After a few minutes, he chuckled. Is something wrong? Nancy, with a puzzled expression, requested, Wait, let me demonstrate something. The appraiser fetched his laptop and placed it on a nearby table. With a few keystrokes, he displayed a website. Zooming in on the bottom left corner of the train station picture on the screen, he pointed out, Here, you can see a man and a little girl standing on the platform. They are watching a woman walking towards the train, oblivious to their presence. The man appears very sad, and the girl is in tears. Nancy, feeling a bit confused, inquired, I understand. So, what? Before she could finish her sentence, the appraiser interrupted, Now? Take a look at the same scene in your painting. Handing Nancy the magnifying glass, he added, Here you go. Nancy glanced quickly at the bottom left corner and felt a wave of dizziness. She exclaimed, In your painting, both the man and the little girl are laughing and pointing at the woman, as if they are teasing her. It's... It's not real. Nancy stuttered. Overwhelmed, she continued, Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's a pretty convincing forgery. Shocked, Nancy grabbed a chair and sank into it, feeling utterly defeated. The appraiser offered, I can give you $200. I just want to hang it for my friends and clients to have a good laugh. Nancy reluctantly accepted the offer and left, her emotions shattered. Shortly after, her phone rang, displaying her sister's name on the screen. Hi, sis, Nancy said, attempting to hide her misery. Her sister's voice, filled with anger, shouted, Don't call me sis, you witch. Tom received an email from a stranger, 
and he forwarded it to everyone we know. It's a link to a website with videos of you and some guy. The videos are dated from a year ago until last week. How could you do this, Nancy? Nancy's mind raced as she tried to respond. I. I need to explain. Her sister cut her off abruptly, declaring, No need. You're disgusting. Tom doesn't want you near us. He says you'll ruin me and our daughter. We don't want you here. Go to your lover. The call ended abruptly, leaving Nancy in shock. She realized, oh my God, they found out. They've known all along. Nancy's face contorted in horror as she wondered, what do I do now? Everyone knows. The whole town. I have to get out of here, far away. Five years later, Bill sat in the front row of the church, deep in thought about the morning's phone call. He chose to keep it to himself, not wanting to overshadow the special occasion. He had just escorted Lisa down the aisle, and now watched as his daughter exchanged vows with her college sweetheart at the altar. His mind drifted back to the day Lisa called him in tears. He vividly remembered sitting in his office when her distressed voice came through the phone. Concerned, he asked, What's wrong, honey? Why are you crying? Lisa pleaded urgently, Just come home, Dad. I'm waiting outside our house. Bill's heart raced with worry as he inquired, Why outside? What's happening? Should I call your mom? I'm on my way, sweetheart. As Bill drove to his destination, he felt a growing sense of apprehension. Various thoughts raced through his mind. Why wasn't his daughter at school? Why was she outside the house instead of inside? And why did she insist that he not inform Nancy? Was she injured? Suddenly, he applied the brakes, causing the tires to screech. He had almost run a red light. Keep calm, he told himself. He knew that Lisa had been working on a project late into the night before. In fact, he had even helped her and shared some ideas. Together, they had compiled everything onto a PowerPoint file and saved it on a USB flash drive. Lisa was waiting for him one block down the street. Bill brought the car to a stop, and she quickly got inside. Please don't go to the house, Dad, Lisa pleaded. Okay, Lisa. Tell me what's going on. Bill turned off the engine. I forgot my USB drive this morning when I was rushing to school. I received special permission to come home during lunchtime and retrieve it. When I arrived, I noticed an unfamiliar car in our driveway. I entered the house and heard strange noises coming from your room. Quietly, I crept up the stairs and peeked inside. The door wasn't completely closed. Lisa began to cry. Okay, sweetheart, take a deep breath. Bill said in a soothing voice as he gently stroked her back. Take your time. Lisa composed herself and continued, I saw a man. They were both without clothes. They were being intimate, Dad. She's cheating on you, on us. Bill sat there in shock, realizing that his 17-year-old daughter understood what infidelity meant. Are you sure about what you saw? He asked, turning to face her. I recorded it on my phone, Lisa replied. She used her phone to capture it. She then showed it to her dad. Bill's world came to a sudden halt as he heard Nancy's moans. Dad, please get her out of the house. I don't want to see her anymore. She's not my mom. My real mom wouldn't do things like this. Bill needed time to consider his options. What's there to consider? Lisa demanded. Just kick her out. Bill sighed and responded. It's not that simple, honey. There are legal steps we have to take. We need to understand why she did it, if it was a one-time mistake, or if it has been happening for a while, or if it will continue. At that moment, they saw Nancy approaching. Lisa gestured towards the departing Anda, turning away from their view. Let's follow him, Bill, she said. Bill started the car's engine, and they trailed the Anda to a nearby store. They spotted the man putting on his work jacket as he left his car in the parking lot and headed towards the employee entrance. He works here, Bill observed. Seems quite young. Age doesn't matter to me, Lisa replied, snapping some photos of the man in his car. We figured one thing out. So, sweetie, I'll drop you off at school, then I'll swing back home, grab your flash drive, and bring it to you. When I talk to your mom, she's not my mom, Lisa interrupted sharply. I'll tell Nancy that you called me and asked me to bring it over. I don't want you facing her alone. Not now, not ever. Got it? I get it, but why? Bill asked. Because I don't want her suspecting that we're onto her. I don't want you accidentally revealing our suspicions in your anger, 
Lisa explained. What's your plan? Bill inquired. I want to be involved in everything you're doing. I need to be kept in the loop. Promise? Lisa insisted. I promise to keep you updated. I love you, Dad, Bill reassured her. Lisa hugged Bill tightly. Love you, too. Now take me to school and hurry back with the USB. My class is starting soon. Bill pulled into the driveway and entered the house. Honey, I'm home, he called out. Nancy hurried out of the bedroom, looking surprised. Oh, Bill, it's you. Who else were you expecting? Bill locked eyes with Nancy. I wasn't expecting you back so soon. Lisa called. She forgot her flash drive, and I need to take it to her. He approached Nancy and noticed a familiar scent. How about a quickie? He suggested. A quickie? I'm a bit tired from cleaning, and I'm all sweaty. You wouldn't enjoy it. Plus, you need to get Lisa her USB, Nancy replied. You're right. I'm off to work, Bill said. Later, Bill browsed the internet for the best surveillance gadgets and cell phone monitoring software. He went to an electronics store and purchased everything he needed. He made a firm decision. He wouldn't touch his wife from that day on. True to his word, he shared everything with Lisa over the next three months. He gathered a wealth of information. He discovered Nancy's lover, Jason White, who visited their place almost daily. Nancy would often go to Jason's apartment if he wasn't working. Bill even learned that she had a spare key. He witnessed Jason and Nancy sharing intimate moments and overheard Nancy and her friend Betty divulging their secrets, including Betty's affair with Nancy's brother-in-law. One Saturday, Bill found the spare key hidden in Nancy's handbag. He quickly made his way to the shopping mall and had a duplicate key made. The following week, he headed to Jason's apartment, which was located in a neglected neighborhood with no security cameras and an unlocked main entrance. Inside, he discreetly installed small hidden cameras powered by long-lasting lithium button cells. While searching the apartment, he also discovered all the expensive gifts that Nancy had bought for Jason. Bill devised a plan to end his relationship with Nancy while causing them both significant harm. He approached a skilled goldsmith and requested replicas of all Nancy's jewelry, which turned out to be gold-plated copper. Additionally, he arranged for a professional artist to create a counterfeit version of Pagnol, the train station, following specific instructions. To execute his plan, Bill reached out to his childhood friend Steve, who worked as a corporate lawyer. After explaining his intentions, Steve scheduled a meeting a few days later. During the meeting, Bill met with Steve and his cousin Linda, who was an experienced auditor. He candidly shared his goal of legally dismantling his company and managing it remotely. Ultimately, he wanted Lisa to repurchase the company in a few years. Bill began having regular meetings with Linda, either at her office or over lunch. As time went on, a friendship blossomed between them. One evening, Bill invited Linda to dinner and a movie, which she accepted. On that particular night, Lisa stayed overnight at a friend's house, while Bill pretended to work late. He parked his car in Linda's driveway and expressed his gratitude to her for agreeing to go out. This is the first time I've been on a date since my husband passed, she mentioned. I understand. I had a great time, Bill replied. Can we go out again sometime when you're available? Just remember, we work together and you're still married, Linda reminded him. She kissed Bill on the cheek. Let's take things slowly, one step at a time. With that, she headed into her house. Bill urged Nancy to switch her car, but she hesitated since she was fond of her Lexus. However, when he suggested that driving a BMW convertible would make her appear younger, she enthusiastically agreed. Bill sold the paid-off Lexus and received cash for it. Then, he secured a car loan for the BMW, putting everything in Nancy's name. When Nancy signed the paperwork, she believed it was solely for the ownership certificate. Unbeknownst to her, among those documents were others that would later cause problems for her. A couple of weeks later, Bill noticed that after Nancy went to the bathroom, following intimacy with Jason, he would leave the bedroom naked and go to Lisa's room. He brought this to Lisa's attention, and she was extremely angry. They decided to install a camera in her room. What they discovered was alarming Jason would open a drawer and take Lisa's underwear. The same afternoon, while Nancy was sitting on the couch, Lisa approached her from behind with a knife. If Bill hadn't intervened at that moment, Lisa would have harmed Nancy. 
Later that evening, Lisa told her father that she wouldn't have been imprisoned if she and Nancy had been on their own because she was still a minor. Bill wasn't surprised when he overheard Jason convincing Nancy to divorce him and take him for everything he had. But what the couple didn't realize was that Bill was already steps ahead of them. He knew Nancy often let Jason drive the BMW and engage in intimate activities with her in the back seat. He also knew that when Nancy sought a divorce lawyer recommended by Paul, the lawyer would investigate his company and assets. After waiting a couple of days, Bill took out a second mortgage on his house to cover Lisa's full tuition fees. The next day, he filed for bankruptcy, timing it so that Betty would change the locks on their house while they were away in New York during the weekend barbecue party before Lisa left for college. Both Bill and Lisa played their parts, with Paul and Betty acting as if nothing was amiss, even helping with the grilling. No one would suspect they were plotting against them. On Friday morning, while Nancy was in the bathroom, Bill grabbed her phone and sent a message to Jason. I'll be at your place by 8. I want us to be intimate in a different way before we part ways for good. Hurry home and prepare, my dear. I'll inform them that I need to run errands. Please don't call or text back. I'll leave my phone at home in case they check. I'll see you later, my future partner. After sending the text, Bill erased it and discreetly returned the phone to Nui's purse. Little did Jason know that as soon as he entered, three individuals would surprise and confront him. They would physically harm him, forcing him to resign via email. Then, they would make him inform his landlord that he is moving out. After drugging him, they would clean his place, remove the hidden cameras, and take away all valuables, making it appear as though he had left. They would wrap him up and transport him in a van, making him disappear without a trace. Bill would keep all of this a secret, something he would never reveal to Lisa or Linda. On Friday afternoon after being served, Bill checked into a motel. He chuckled while watching the evening news. Before dinner, one of the individuals from Jason's place arrived. He handed over all the cameras and received payment. No words were exchanged. He didn't disclose where Jason's body ended up buried either. Saturday morning, Bill got rid of his old phone, obtained a new one, and shared his new number with Lisa. Then, he went to Linda's house. There, he dedicated his time to sorting through and editing the video footage. He blurred Jason's face to prevent any connections if Jason were to go missing. Bill stayed in the guest room, bonding with Linda's child. Bill and Linda initiated the final step of their plan, where an elderly couple from Seattle, who happened to be Linda's relatives, would purchase the company. None of the staff members would lose their jobs. On Monday, Lisa called to inform Bill that Nancy was searching for him. They both shared a laugh. Later, Bill posted all the videos on an explicit website using a fake email address. He sent the link to everyone they knew including Nye's brother-in-law. Bill remained at Linda's place for three more months until his divorce was settled. They continued dating but refrained from physical intimacy until Bill was officially single. Bill agreed to honor his marriage vows until the end. Staying at Linda's home had its advantages. If anyone inquired, Bill could claim he was completely broke and temporarily staying at Linda's until he got back on his feet. On the day of the divorce hearing, Nancy failed to appear in court. With the house and Nye's car already taken away, and with Bill being financially unstable and unemployed, the judge swiftly granted the divorce without any spousal support or asset division. Nye's lawyer didn't contest it. Later, as they crossed paths in the hallway, the lawyer remarked, You are quite the strategist, Mr. Thompson. I saw Bill's brow furrow, and then he walked away, back to the present. Dad, pay attention, I said. Oh, sorry, sweetie. What were you saying? I reminded him, it's time for the father-daughter dance, and everyone's watching, but you're not moving. He admitted, my mind was somewhere else, princess. Bill took my hand, spun me around, and we began dancing to the music. Now I have to dance with your mom, Bill told Lisa when the song ended. And I promised my little brother he'd be next, Lisa said with a smile. Bill approached Linda and asked her to dance. Later, he went to the bar and ordered a whiskey. Sitting down, his thoughts turned to a phone call he had received at home in his bedroom. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. I'm Dr. Henry Duza from Dallas, Texas. It's about your wife. Confused, Bill asked. What's wrong with my wife? She's in the next room right now. I mean, Nancy Thompson, the doctor clarified. Bill hadn't heard that name in five years, and he sank onto the bed. 
Go on, doctor, he said, bewildered. I'm a psychologist, and I'm treating my patient Nancy Thompson in her final days. Doctor, Duza explained. Her final days? Bill questioned. Yes, Mr. Thompson. Do you have a few minutes for me to explain the situation briefly? Bill agreed, still trying to comprehend what he was hearing. Your ex-wife shared her life story with me, from her childhood to when we met, the doctor continued. She said you were the only man she knew until she met Jason, a big mistake she regrets. She talked about planning the divorce and what came after. She believes you knew about the affair and set her up. She's come to terms with losing you and your daughter because she knows she was in the wrong. When she left town, she only had $200. She wanted to get away from everything, especially after the video recordings of her affairs surfaced. She hopped on the first bus and ended up in Texas. She found work as a waitress in a bar by Interstate 20, mostly frequented by truckers. The owner gave her a cheap room in exchange for favors. After a year, she became pregnant and had to resort to a risky termination without proper medical care. Later, the owner started pressuring her into intimate encounters with the truckers for money. Some used protection, but others didn't. By the time she went to the hospital, she had severe STDs and AIDS. She's very sick and knows she's dying. Her last wish is to see you before she passes away. I'm really sorry to hear that, doctor. My daughter's getting married today. I'll reach out to you next week, Bill replied. Don't wait too long, mister. Thompson, here's my direct line number. Hey, honey, take it easy on the drinks. You're driving us home, Linda said as she hugged her husband and gave him a sweet kiss. Bill pushed his glass aside and said, I'd never risk your safety or our son's. Let's hit the dance floor. I want to feel you close, Linda whispered. A few days later, from his office, Bill called Dr. Duza to say he couldn't make the trip south due to his heavy workload. The doctor suggested Bill speak to Nancy over the phone, and he would connect the call to her hospital ward, where there was a cordless phone a nurse could bring to Nancy's bedside. Bill, is that you? Nancy's voice was barely audible. Yes, Nancy, it's me, Bill replied. Nancy's voice broke into tears as she said, I'm sorry, Bill. Truly sorry for what I put you and our family through. Now I'm facing the consequences. I have forgiven you, Nancy. I have moved on with my life, and I am happy, Bill said, pausing to take a deep breath. In fact, I owe you thanks. After our divorce, I married an incredible woman, and we have a son together. Lisa considers her as her mother, and they have a wonderful relationship. By the way, Lisa got married last Saturday, and the wedding was absolutely beautiful. Her mom made sure everything was perfect. We are both excited about becoming grandparents. Bill could hear Nancy sobbing on the other end of the line. There was a commotion in the background of Nancy's hospital room. He waited patiently until a frantic voice interrupted. Mr. Thompson, I'm Nurse Angelica. I'm sorry, but I have to end the call. The line went silent. Bill glanced at the family photo on his desk, smiling to himself. He who laughs last, laughs best, he murmured.